Dear DLD friends, ladies, gentlemen, this is now the high point. We're, uh, how would you say it? We're coming closer to the high point of, of today. It was a full day. And not to spend too much time with introduction, not just David, I would like to introduce to you David Kirkpatrick, who will moderate the next sessions and who has a lot of spark, actually. <laughs> so who knows David? Who knows David? Very good. Could someone help David for a sec? Um, I think that's okay. It's no problem. I, I last yesterday I was breaking class, breaking classes, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a good a omen for a good. Beginning. Yeah, but we don't want to let our first panelists wait too long. Um, this is like a pattern now you're laying out here. Could someone help? Okay, you're fine. It, it's it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. David, question to you, because you, are, you have been a DLD friend also for many years, and you're a very experienced long-term journalist. You have been with Fortune magazine how long? Uh, 25 years. 25 years, senior editor at Fortune magazine. So David really understands the full impact of the changing digital innovate economy and, and what was before and how media changed. And we said, you will be the right, the best person to moderate this really important session on the future of media, uh, which we'll do like now. And we have two CEOs and another very important man um, uh, on this stage later. Um, but then basically what you did last year was you, you decided to write a book, actually. Um, the book is on Facebook. It's called, how it is called? It's called The Facebook Effect, the inside story of the company that is connecting the world. And it comes out in June 15th in Simon & Schuster in the United States. Looking for a German publisher, too. You're looking? Okay, talk to and, me later. And, and, and the first, uh, the first uh, interview should be on the board, I hope <laughs> so. Anyhow, so the f Facebook effect, and last year we spoke with Mark Zuckerberg actually on, on, on Facebook, and he said we have two million people now on Facebook in Germany, and now they have 11 million. That was just one year. Wait, um, they don't have 11 million in Germany. I thought so. No, they wish. <laughs> they wish they had 11 million. They have a lot more than two million, but they don't yet have 11. Okay. They're, they're, um, they're still working hard. They're still working hard. This um, session now is on the future of media, old and new media, and, and I think um, you should... What do you expect from this session? Well, I think we're really going to be talking about the intersection of old and new media, and, and we have two CEOs to begin who are especially thoughtful about the digital realities in which you know, we all live. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think among media executives, you're going to find both of them are extremely unusual for how conversant they are with the digital stuff that we talk about here so much. Okay. So we call now the first on stage, CEO of Thomson Reuters, Tom Close. We're very happy having you here. It's the first time, actually. Welcome, Tom. And now the floor is yours. And then later we have Paul Bernard Kahn listening. Thank you, Marcel. And Tom, it's great to have you here. Um, you know, it's funny. I was talking to him earlier, you know, trying to do a little prep thing. And, uh, and he said that he had used his Columbia alumni email address to get into Facebook before it was even open to ordinary adults. So I asked him why did he do that, and then he said uh, he also had been at the uh, Allen and Company Sun Valley thing one year when they said, how many people in the room have actually created an avatar in Second Life, and he was the only CEO to raise his hand. The, the, the point of it being that he has a policy of trying out the new things which I think is extremely cool and smart and extremely unusual. But why do you have that policy? Well, I think there are two reasons. So one, I've always believed, whether it's technology or anything else, you go where your passion is. So it interests me, and therefore I do it. And I've never believed you know, in all of the official sort of HR propaganda that you have to spend all your time doing what you're not good at or what doesn't interest you. So, you know, I'm, there are a lot of people in my company who are really good at budget reviews. I'm okay, I've gotten by, but I'm much, much better at working on the innovation agenda. So I do, I do that by choice. And I guess to the extent I've thought about it later, and this is one of those after the fact philosophies, not why I started, but um, I've come to believe that if you don't play with whatever the gadgetry or memes of the age are, 
you can't dream the big dreams. You know, had I not been playing with Yossi's ICQ in the early days of instant messaging, I don't think I would have thought, hey, actually we could build a really interesting instant messaging community in the financial services world with IM and presence as it's at their attributes rather than, let's say, an asynchronous email paradigm. And that proved to be a good business decision, presumably? Um, we have about 130,000 finance professionals, which is small when you consider, you know, large consumer networks, but um, is a, a very loyal and, and high utilization group. Um, so, yeah, no, it's good. And high, high, high margin customer base, in a sense, or high, high revenue and margin. So it's good to keep them happy is all I'm saying. Yes. And so there's big and small consequences because you also said that, uh, remember when all the articles, including mine, about Second Life were written in the sort of heyday? We talked about the Reuters reporter who was embedded in Second Life reporting on it full time. The reason that happened was because he had gotten in, in so interested in Second Life so early, uh, the CEO drove that. So, um, but is this because, you know, at that time you were CEO of Reuters, now you're CEO of Thomson Reuters. This is kind of a lead into you describe the company, which I think you should do, because it's newly large and, and complicated and hard for some of us to really grasp all the things that it does, and I want you to explain that. But is it because it's very heavily an electronicized business that you feel you need to do these things, or would you be doing them even if you were running a tractor company? Um, well, I think the great thing, if you get to have a job that um, is an area that interests you, then you get to justify all sorts of stuff that you'd probably do anyway that has um, value to the company. And, and I don't want to suggest at all that, you know, just because I went to a conference and I play with Second Life, you know, I sort of ordered this whole Reuters presence in Second Life or the, f the first bureau in Second Life. It's more that um, really creative, talented people who are also already doing it in the company have somebody to look at uh, and say, it must be okay. Like, we can come forward with some pretty crazy ideas like, you know, the 158-year-old trusted news organization, how in the world could it open a bureau in Second Life and report on news both in the cyber world and in the quote-unquote real world, and how do you make that distinction, and how do you stay that playful? So I think um, it, it's more an issue of inspiration and aligning people who are already doing those things, but in most companies, it gets squelched because they don't have support from the top. Whereas in, you know, uh, a Google, the whole top rank is going to be playful and foot forward. In more established com companies, I mean, look what Dr. Berta has done with Berta. How many publishers there are around the world that lack, you know, the inspiration of somebody who's gotten what this generation's about as clearly um, as Hubert has? It's fantastic. We're going to hear a lot about that in a minute, but talk to me about what Thomson Reuters does and what it is and, and how you, what, to what degree you do think of yourself as a technology company. Um, we have basically a pretty simple business. It's around $12.5 billion of revenue every year. 90% of it is subscription. 90% of it um, is electronic. And it's all about delivering content and software to professionals in their place of work, whether they're bankers, traders, lawyers, uh, accountants, doctors, uh, biochem engineers, it's deep professional content and the software as services needed to do their jobs, all, if you will, behind the paywall. So is that a technology company? Um, it's not a technology company per se, although we sell a lot of software, but it's a company from its roots has thought of technology in a, in a fairly abstract way. So, you know, right now, obviously, when we think of technology, we're surrounded by the significance of the Internet. But at least as I tell the story going back in Reuters history, 
uh, at one point technology was pigeons, and they were an improvement on the prevailing technology of the day. At one point it was rowboats, at one point it was the telegraph. Um, I think one of the traps that a lot of companies get into, and I put a good amount of the newspaper publishers into there, is the inability to abstract away from the distribution mechanism of the day and see truly what it is they do. You know, uh, it has been a long uh, surviving and qu quite a good medium to publish on paper produced from a particular wood paper pulp process. But to me, that is not what the core of you know, Foz or the Zeit or the New York Times is about. And if you define your life only in the technology of your era, the, o the one thing that will be clear is you won't outlive that technology. Of course, that sort of mindset kind of at some points may force you to cannibalize your most successful businesses in order to anticipate what comes next, doesn't it? I mean, that's what makes that hard. Because companies typically have a great cash cow or something, they hope to have a cash cow, and they, they, don't ho they want it never to go away. And often, looking down the over the horizon, you see something is going to probably happen, though the question is how soon do you embrace it? I mean, how do you think about that? How do you manage that? I mean, there are you know, huge amounts been written. I'm not going to improve on Clayton Christensen and the whole innovator's dilemma. Uh, but I think one has to be constantly playful. You can't become complacent and believe that, you know, your particular combination of content and distribution technology is going to be there for a long time. And I think what often happens as we make transitions from one technology to another, we carry with us restrictions um, which are born of the last technology but are unneeded anymore. So, for example, um, the first generation of newspaper websites you know, carried over this idea of we'll break the news at a particular time or we don't do video, we're a newspaper. And, you know, why is that the case? You're now in a new medium. It reminds me of, you know, in early, early days of broadcast television, uh, you'd often see this horrible video of announcers being filmed standing in front of radio microphones because that's all they could understand that they would do. They hadn't yet lost the, the, the crutches of the last um, They idiom. still do that in ESPN, and doesn't Rush Limbaugh do that? I mean, a lot yeah. of people do that. Well, anyway, they do. Or here's another example. Um, in the early days, you know, walking down the street, say, in New York, you'd see people on cell phones standing in phone booths. Like, they were felt awkward, rude, just walking down the street, so they'd stop in phone booths. Now, why in the world would you do that? It's the exact opposite of the, what you've been liberated from. Well, sometimes making these transitions, is ta it just takes a little conceptual work for, for us as individuals. But, you know, you said before you're basically providing content for professionals, but you seem to, you have a lot of consumer-oriented, I mean, Reuters is used by consumers as well as professionals. Do you think of yourself also as being in the consumer content business? Um, well, I think of it differently. I think that our professional audience aren't only lawyers or bankers or accountants. They're human beings, too, and therefore they care about, you know, what was the Juventus score or the New York Jets score, um, and they care about general news happening in their lives as well. Um, I think the real interesting uh, trend, though, that we all have to watch is um, Consumer technology is now setting the grade for professional services. And therefore, a lot of what we're doing now in our most professional services is going out and benchmarking ourselves against the very best in consumer search. How are we better? You know, every day, uh, Westlaw has to, which gets about a million professional searches a day, has to do better searching for lawyers than, let's say, um, Google or Bing or somebody else does. For example, Google. Yeah. 
That's so, the relevant. But but now you just recently bought Breaking Views, right? Why did you do that? I'm just is, that seems like a kind of a consumer content business. Is that sort of for that reason? And I know it's a, kind of a minor acquisition in the scale oh, of a twelve no. billion dollar company. You know, whenever we have 2,700 journalists, I think Breaking Views had 22, including the very talented Hugo Dixon um, as editor-in-chief. Um, whenever you acquire into a journalism company, um, it is um, somewhat destabilizing in a way that it often isn't in many other uh, walks of life. So one reason we did it was um, to make the point that um, not invented here is not just an issue for the technologists, the product designers. Not invented here is everybody in the company, and we have to be able, even the mighty Reuters has to be able to embrace that there are some great journalists outside, and um, it can't be the only part of the company that's never made an acquisition. Hmm. So One. it was some, something you might need, but it also sent a message that you like the idea of sending. Yeah, and the other thing is that, you know, what we've recognized um, is we need to move up the stack from just uh, raw facts to raw facts plus context to raw facts plus content and analysis and then to the fourth plane, which is commentary. And we had started our own commentary service, and this was a way to essentially accelerate that and take it to video much more quickly than either would have on its own. Yeah, and they're very good, obviously. Uh, so listen, I'm going to ask you to move over a chair, and we're going to continue with you as we go on. We're going to talk to all three of our panelists, and then we're going to uh, talk to them collectively. And at that point, we'll have a chance for you all to ask them questions. I hope we have time. We've got a lot to do in an hour. But uh, Dr. Callan, who's the new CEO of Berta, is our, our next enlightened CEO, and I have to really say, having talked about these guys, I consider them both examples of that, and I say that very seldom, because uh, having been at Fortune for 25 years, I, I don't generally find that to be the, the adjective I use for CEOs. But, you know, it's interesting that you came out of the uh, sort of venture capital piece of Berta. That's what you spent a lot of the last decade doing, right? I mean, talk about a little bit of what you've been doing in Berta before you became CEO. And, and how you've worked with Dr. Berta, uh, helping to build the vision of Berta as it exists already. How I worked with him is uh, easy to, uh, to explain. When I entered the board in January 99, 1999, uh, he took me aside after the first board meeting and uh, saying everybody in the board has to build its own business. Uh, we should go more digital and what's our, your idea on it? Mm. And I said my, my wish would be to create a corporate venture capitalist. Uh, which we did, and which we uh, did for seven, eight years, and out of which came a lot of businesses that we run today. And it was uh, done in a way that we continuously discussed about internet and uh, about the development in the digital arena. And uh, I hope that is the kind of discussion that is going on for a long time, uh, because it's good for every company, it's good for every manager to have an entrepreneur to have an owner which is who is close to the business, is passionate about the business, and is a secret advisor. So the, the fields I covered on top uh, were more in traditional uh, subjects, uh, taking magazines international, looking after the print operation, and uh, looking a bit after the commercial aspects of the business. Talk, talk about some of the internet things that you invested in or, or developed. We, we were clear about the point that we do not know exactly where Internet is developing to, so we tried to build a broad portfolio um, in which you find today content portals living on advertising. Um, for instance, journalistic portals like Focus or Chip, uh, expert portal like Suite 101, or user-generated portal like Holiday Check. Um, both of them, all of them, are very profitable and interesting um, activities. All that checks like a German trip advisor kind yeah, of business. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and not, not only Germany, we are um, Europe, moving, into, Pan, yeah, Europe, moving into France, moving into other countries. Um, we, we did create a few platforms, like uh, partnering platforms. Elite Partner is uh, one good case example. And every now and then we are involved in e-commerce, if it makes sense uh, to be in e-commerce. Um, and uh, the final thing maybe is that we are... We had the chance last fall um, to take a, a, a stake in a Web 2.0 company, which is Xing, and we are very happy that we were able to take a significant stake and become anchor investor in, in Xing. So uh, this is uh, the, the peak of the iceberg. Um, below that is more than 40 
uh, more than 45, better fact, um, activities and companies, um, which if you take 100% turnover, more than a billion US dollar last year. Which is about a quarter of Berta's overall revenue now? Absolutely. Which, and that's growing at what kind of a rate? Um, and if, if we do not do acquisitions, it's in the range of 25% plus. So if a quarter of the, and the rest of the company is growing at what kind of a rate, or is it growing? If uh, it is, normally it's growing, it's not growing last year, but normally it's growing um, because we try to grow our business internationally and there is room oh, yeah. to do. Right. Um, and in Germany we try to be a consolidator in some, in some areas. So normally uh, all parts of our business are growing, uh, but the last year we had some, um, some, some well, well in our Well, you weren't alone in that, I think, unfortunately. We, we, we were alone kind of that. common in the magazine business. But, but so you've got a quarter of the company growing at 25 to 35 uh, percent, and, and now we have the CEO who's come out of the digital and venture capital piece. That's sort of a statement in itself about Dr. Berta's long-term intentions too, I think, not to mention having created and, and, and hosted this great conference for now the sixth year. So, so let's talk about that for a second, because you know, for many of us Americans in particular, I think it was DLD that first got us acquainted with Berta. And you know, it, it seems to have done a lot for repositioning the company, in, at least in the minds of people who come here, and probably a lot of, uh, of wave effects outside of that as well. So talk a little bit about DLD and what you think it's achieved for Berta. I think first of all, it achieved something for the community. Because if you think back six years, we came out of the burst of the evaluation bubble in the internet, um, and everybody was depressed. And I think Kubat Boda, with his instinct for a need of communication, stood up and was the first traditional successful media entrepreneur who, who took the flag and raised it and said, let's come and discuss and, and let's party. And I think that was the first event uh, six years back. And out of that developed what we see today. And I have to say it became better every year. It became more professional every year. And even the parties became more excessive every year. Um, what did it achieve? With Lady um, Gaga, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens tonight. Uh, uh, that's a strong promise wait, wait, after last week. Wait, wait for a surprise. Um, so what, what did it achieve for the company? I think um, the mission was to make clear that, that Boda is well anchored, both in traditional media and in digital media. Um, and uh, I think that was a fairly strong statement uh, done by, by Hubert Boda. Um, and it made clear for everybody in the company that we would like to play a role in digital media and that we would like to, to attract talent which you need to build a position in digital media. And everybody understood that. And if you would ask today, how do you see uh, Hubert Boda Media, everybody would tell you that it is anchored in both traditional media and digital media. Yeah, and there are not many former magazine companies about which that could be said, like I can hardly think of one. Um, speaking of magazines, let's talk about that for a minute because um, that is the kind of core of the company's history. And still, I, the lion's share of revenues come from magazines Right? So in last year, though, Hubert uh, said, I think he said, lousy pennies come from the internet. Uh, what did he mean, and what's the future of the internet piece, and how are magazines and the internet going to interact? And what's the, I guess, the, the final question, it's a lot of questions in one, coming from you know, 30 years of Time Inc. myself, is, is there a future for magazines? And if so, what do you think it is? You, you will let me know if I leave out one. Okay. Um, many, many questions Sorry. are the same. You know, um, the, the, the point is if, if traditional media costs meet um, internet revenues, it doesn't work. And, and I think that is what, what Uber Boda meant last year when he said lousy pennies. So if you have the cost structure of a typical magazine, the journalistic cost structure of a typical med magazine, and try to make your living on CPM advertising, it's rather difficult, if not impossible. Only a few will succeed, and only a few were successful so far. So um, if you're asking me what is, if, what is um, the, the future for, for uh, the internet part of magazines um, over the next few years, I think we have to find formulas to operate on a lower cost base, and we have to find formula to, to, um, to have more earnings, to have more income which is very difficult, and the solution to that is not CPM, it's not banner advertising. The solution to that must be something different. And uh, we try to develop ideas and we try to develop things or sources um, to, to show that and to make it happen. If you, if you ask me about the future of magazines, I think uh, the future of magazines is, is a good, is a bright future. Um, if you are able to do, to do three things, um, the first thing is we, you have to really be passionate 
um, about the magazines and doing the magazines. Each issue has to be better than the last one, and you have to do everything to attract your reader and keep your reader. The second thing is um, I think we have to make the impact of our advertising more measurable. If there is one thing that comes out of internet is that you have to prove more what you achieve with advertising, and we have to look for solutions to do that better. And the third thing is we have all to learn to run our businesses on a lower cost base. Uh, there is no way around it. But if you do all three things, I think magazine will be a very attractive and very good business for the foreseeable future. I mean, this issue of, of um, well, I, I, what, what I often wonder about is the advertiser mentality, because, you know, the advertisers have been funding magazines for all these decades. And you're talking about measurability. Once more measurability can be developed on the website, do you think that the advertisers may get over the hesitation they've had to move the lion's share of their spending? Because in a way, the problem of the magazine business comes from a collective failure of will on the part of the advertisers, or failure of belief, and maybe it's justified or not, but they certainly have never taken their, their, put their money on the magazine online piece the way they have in the print piece. And, and so, what but, do you think about that? But, but that is a general um, CPM or banner problem, if you want so. You know, CPM is a currency where you pay per thousand viewers, uh, which means that the risk that you, con that you do not convert is 100% with the advertiser. Um, CPC, you share the risk, and CPO, the full risk, is with the media company. So in, a, in, a, in an area or in a, in a time when you see lots of oversupply of space, um, and if that oversupply is even faster growing than any demand, it's very tough to believe that CPM um, will have a more important role um, in future. So that means um, you, if, if you, you have to be closer to transactions um, to, to convert better to get more income, and that is a hard thing for many magazines, not for all magazines online, for many magazines online. It's interesting to hear that, though, having just spent a year and a half looking closely at Facebook, because you know, you're saying there's all this essentially excess inventory. One of the interesting things about Facebook is that in advertising, it always drastically limited its inventory, not because of trying to raise revenues exactly, trying to increase the user, improve the user experience, but maybe you all have created too much inventory. I don't know. It's is there a possibility of that? In, in, in some, we have created too much inventory, and we do, do so every, every day. The point is that we have to, to understand that there is journalistic energy and, and, and power out there more than traditional media is able to pay. So many, 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 many people uh, are willing to do things online, put things online, um, not being paid, but being promised that they get a certain share of the advertising that comes out. In traditional media, that is absolutely impossible. Uh, but that is the rule in, in Internet. And as long as we have much more talented people that are willing to do that on a, on a revenue share basis, you will see oversupply. But also that makes it a good business because you can't lose as much money that way, right? I mean, if For, they're doing it on a revenue share basis, magazines can get no ads and you still got to pay the journalist, right? That yeah. is exactly what Sweet 101 is doing. Yeah. Um, but for a traditional media company to do that with your own journalists is a no, difficult challenge. I'm not recommending it, don't get me wrong.